Um, good morning, everyone. I wanted to thank Judy first for these kind words. Really, um, it's above and beyond what I really do. Um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to welcome everyone um, at the Apple Valley College in our new state-of-the-art facility here. We are very excited to be hosting um, the seminar um, in our grounds in conjunction with um, the Bay Area region. Um, at RHT initiative, um, the association of the um, hotel and lodging, American Association of um, Hotel and Lodging, and um, um, we are really, and the State Department of Education, we are really, really excited to see all of you come together um, with us, hopefully um, to create pipelines for our students to learn from the leaders in the industry and get um, inspired all for the benefit of our students. Um, so um, you all know, and I would like to join you in thanking both Judy Moon, who is doing the, um, and Andrea Wiesener for their leadership in creating um, the seminar for us today, um, making it happen, inviting our guests, and working endless hours for us to be together. Um, I hope to be um, a resource for um, folks, if they would like to create programs with us, I would hope to brainstorm with you for grant initiatives to make, um, to help programs come together. Um, I would like to uh, wish you all a wonderful um, day here at DVC and a pleasant experience with the seminar. We have amazing speakers, leaders from the industry come together. So uh, thank you all for being here and have a wonderful day. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna actually put this in the holder because I'm definitely not a microphone person. <laughs> Good morning, everyone remembers me from yesterday. Um, Andrea Visner, Deputy Sector Navigator of Retail, Hospitality, and Tourism. And that is the, qu the quiz question for Saturday. So please make sure you know what that means. <laughs> Um, I did not create the title, I promise. Um, but I am absolutely thrilled for today because we have this amazing agenda for you. We have really innovative industry folks that are gonna spend their time with you today and share some great culinary techniques, some innovative skills about industry and how um, restaurants and different operational um, parts of the industry are advancing and really embracing the community and doing some great work. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. Steven Satterfield is a manager at Nopa Restaurant in San Francisco. And the reason why I'm so thrilled to <laughs> introduce him is because I had the pure pleasure of having lunch with him in an afternoon with a couple of folks brainstorming some great ideas. And the moment he started talking, I was like, yes, this guy gets it. <laughs> it was education, it was community, and it was the hospitality industry. And his background is exciting, it's fresh, it's innovative, and he's going to be able to share some really exciting stuff Stuff with you today and I'm just absolutely thrilled to have him here and so Stephen come on up and, and start off our, our day thank you thank you Andrea Appreciate it. all right I'm gonna crank this up a bit good morning you guys how are you good morning. um okay maybe I'll pull this Perfect. Um, so before I get started, um, I just kind of want to take a survey of the room because I've done some reading and I think I have a sense. I know that uh, most of you all are educators, which I very much admire. Um, but maybe just a show of hands, uh, how many of you all are actually teaching in uh, hospitality or the culinary arts? All right, so we have a, a pretty well-versed room here. And I'll just uh, start off by giving you guys a little bit of background, my own personal narrative, and the way that many of these talks begin. 
Um, and then I will go into the, um, the program or my talk for today and of course leave some time at the end for questions. Um, but before I get into that, I should start off by saying that um, I have a 12 o'clock noon flight to Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I'm from. I'm gonna go home and visit mom and dad for the first time this year. Uh, so if you see me leave abruptly, um, that's why. It's not because I don't wanna be with you guys, but I have to, to jam back up to the city. Um, that being said, I very much wanted to be here. In fact, we changed around um, our travel schedule because after the aforementioned lunch with Andrea um, and learning more about this program, uh, I felt really an inherent responsibility to um, share whatever knowledge or insight that I've garnered over the last uh, 12 years or so in the industry, um, as well as to learn from you guys to get insight about uh, some of the things that you're seeing from your students and the uh, generation ahead. Um, to that end, I'll just go ahead and tell you guys now, uh, if you have any questions or if you would like to contact me personally uh, and I don't have a chance, my email address is the best way to reach me. Um, and that is Stephen, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N at Nopalize, it's N-O-P-A-L-I-Z-E dot com. And we'll talk a little bit about Nopalize uh, here in just a second. Um, okay, so just to get things started, um, I, as I just mentioned, am from Atlanta and uh, had kind of what you would call a, a quintessential uh, experience as a, a southerner with food and that is to say uh, my granny was or her house was kind of our ground zero every Sunday we would gather and have uh, all the cousins and aunts and uncles get together for uh, a weekly supper and I didn't realize it at the time of course um, really how special or formative those weekly gatherings were for our family. Um, but as I've grown older, I can say unequivocally that the reason that I developed such a profound love for food um, is because it was instilled in me when I was very young. Um, sadly, my grandmother passed uh, when she was just 59 years old. She had diabetes. Um, so. Uh, we, or I guess she never really had a chance to see me grow into, uh, you know, her grandson who was so into food because she so loved food. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, due to some of the, the dieting or lack thereof, um, you know, she wasn't able to, to be with us. Um, and you know, I, I know that sounds very somber, um, but that was in 1990. And um, over the course of the last you know, 24 years or so, obviously we have come quite a long way in the way of nutrition and understanding more about health. Um, and I think that one of the most exciting things that's happening in the food community isn't just in the realm of um, access to food and understanding food and so forth. Um, but really, we're eating, uh, or the generation that's coming up is, is eating better than ever. Um, and it's almost kind of a, a, a default, a byproduct of our uh, growing and continual interest in local and sustainable food. Um, so anyway, we, we live and learn, but um, those were definitely the seeds for me um, in terms of getting into food, but it wasn't really a linear path. It wasn't as if I just grew up and, uh, you know, was like boiling eggs when I was six years old, you know, or scrambling or whatever. Um, I for actually resisted cooking for quite a long time because I was a spoiled brat. Because um, after my grandmother, uh, my, my father kind of took the lead in our family in terms of, um, of hospitality and also cooking. My dad is an amazing cook. So every Saturday morning, um, 
we would have these like really, really elaborate breakfasts. And I learned later that he got as much out of cooking it as, and probably more than we got out of eating it. Um, but I think, again, that sort of innate sense of hospitality and um, of course you guys are all food lovers so you know that feeling very well you know that um, cooking for people especially loved ones uh, is oftentimes uh, a bigger thrill for the person cooking than it is for the person eating so uh, I've definitely taken that to heart as well um, so after being spoiled rotten uh, and growing up in Atlanta I had a moment, uh, I think it was, oh yeah, it must have been my senior year of high school, um, where I decided, you know what, I'm ready to leave Atlanta. I've seen enough here. Uh, I was not an excellent student. Uh, in fact, I was a very poor student, um, which is kind of a, a funny thing for me to say in a room full of educators. But I can tell you that because my mother um, is actually uh, an elementary school principal. And um, in fact, when I was in her belly, she was a, a teacher in Atlanta. So I really, really grew up in the school system. And uh, I have uh, a tremendous appreciation for um, the role of educators and, and how important your work is. Um, and again, that's part of the reason why I, I wanted to be here today, um, albeit unlikely given my uh, academic track record. Um, but when I, was, when I was in high school, um, I, like many angst-ridden young teenagers, uh, decided I wanted to try something totally different and to move beyond my environment, see something new. So I moved to Eugene, Oregon, um, which was very different from Atlanta. It's still very different from Atlanta. Uh, and I moved there without ever having gone to visit. Um, it, yeah, exactly. Uh, if you can, if you can imagine that, uh, because it fit my only criteria of being as far away from Atlanta as possible. <laughs> so mission accomplished there. Uh, three weeks after I apply, they said, "Sure, you know, come to Eugene." I think this is probably before they uh, they must have had looser academic standards back then. Um, so I, I moved to Eugene, Oregon, uh, I guess that was in 2002. Um, and that was really, unbeknownst to me at the time, what kind of set my whole career trajectory off. Um, I thankfully ended up loving Eugene. It's a, a really wonderful place to go to college. They have a beautiful campus. Uh, it's ridiculously green all year round because it rains all year round. Um, but uh, it was really an amazing uh, experience for me just being on the West Coast, being in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I mean, I guess I should mention that in my senior year of high school, I, I did start to um, sort of dabble a bit more in food, uh, not necessarily as uh, a cook, although I, I was following some recipes. Um, but actually the Food Network, which I'll talk about later on, um, was starting to come on in the late 90s and early 2000s. And um, there was just more information about food. Food was gradually starting to seep into uh, the crevices of popular culture. And um, I, I caught on to it. I used to watch the Food Network and uh, you know the, the PBS after school specials pretty much every day. So that that seed was uh, again planted. And then when I moved to Oregon, I was in school for uh, about a year there. Uh, and again, I told you guys, school wasn't really in my bag. So I, I made a decision um, after my first year in college to move up uh, an hour up I-5 to Portland um, to go to culinary school. And I can't exactly remember um, what the impetus was, it, it might have been, um, you know, the financial burden of being in school. It might have just been the fact that I was really far away from finding my voice, or it could have just been 
uh, that I was like, you know, the last time I made a really spontaneous, impulsive decision, it kind of worked out. Maybe I'll do the same thing again. So I did, and um, in 2004, uh, 10 years ago, I enrolled at Western Culinary Institute in Portland, Oregon, um, in their hospitality and restaurant management program. Um, so from there, uh, the first second, the first day that I was in class, I knew undoubtedly that I had found my calling. Um, I was front row center in class every day. I had lots of questions. I was engaged. It was an amazing feeling. Um, it kind of surprised me even, you know, I wasn't really prepared to be so engrossed in learning, um, but there was an immediate validation there um, so that I knew that I was on the right track. Um, so originally I planned on uh, becoming a chef, uh, but I took the hospitality route because I thought maybe if I'm going to be a chef, I should at least know how to run a restaurant. Um, but then I actually started to work in a kitchen, so I had two jobs and I was going to culinary school, which was kind of crazy. But one of the jobs that I had was um, uh, the gar manger, so the, the cold salad and dessert prep station um, or service station. And uh, I was immediately humbled and said, you know what? I don't really know if this part of it is for me. I like all these other elements, but uh, it's very, very difficult to be a chef. Um, and as we heard earlier, uh, there's no such thing as an eight hour workday in the kitchen. Not that there is in the front of house, but it's a different brand of work when there's like fire and sharp stuff and people screaming. I was cool on that. So um, I decided to, to focus my energies um, on hospitality and um, specifically on wine. And the wine thing, uh, I was only 20 years old, but it was part of our curriculum at the time. Um, and no one knew that I was a minor because there just weren't really minors in hospitality school at, at that time. Um, so I had, uh, and I know this is my statute of limitations, so I feel good talking about this, <laughs> but um, I had a really amazing wine education at the age of 20. And, um, and it wasn't just in the way of like, yes, I'm getting to drink on the sly, but it was like, wow, this is a completely new language. I'm learning how to speak a second language, and this language is a key. Um, it was a completely different lens to uh, see the world. And because I was in Oregon, um, I had the great fortune of my teacher, the educator, um, was also a winemaker. And, you know, for instance, if I would have made the decision to go to culinary school in Atlanta or pretty much anywhere else outside of the West Coast, um, that education would have been a lot more linear, and I don't know if I would have really uh, felt the kind of immersive quality of, of wine, um, because I had the opportunity to go travel to the Willamette Valley, to go um, see how wine was produced, to go see how it was grown, um, and that early, um, I mean, not just in my years, but also kind of the most people start off drinking wine, uh, you know, with friends or maybe in college, and you kind of work your way up. But I started off with a really skilled winemaker telling me really technical things about how it was produced. I got to go to cellars, I got to go to vineyards, um, and that's really why um, and how I, I became so interested in wine, and that really um, has transformed my life. So um, after culinary school, I simultaneously start, was taking classes to become a sommelier. Um, and by the time I was 21, I had already gotten my sommelier certification. Uh, and I had gotten, uh, I was just finishing up with culinary school. So by the time I was 22, uh, I was a sommelier and I had gotten hired to manage a pretty high profile restaurant in Portland, um, which was total random luck, right place, right time. 
the restaurant was called Genoa. It started in 1971 and actually just closed last year. Um, but 1971, for Bay Area food historians, is the same year that Chez Panisse opened. Um, so that was kind of the first wave of this current iteration of food that we're in that puts such a high precedent on sourcing and sustainability um, and local food or the local food movement. Um, and Genoa was kind of a, a, a sibling restaurant to Chez Panisse. It was way, way ahead of its time in terms of sourcing um, and really looking at the ingredients as the stars uh, as much as the technique being the star. Um, so that was an amazing opportunity for me um, because that restaurant had uh, already, by the time I was there, a really, really long tradition and pedigree of talented chefs. And um, this is before Portland was the coolest place on the planet. Um, and Portland has been quietly they, they deserve this uh, this current heyday that they're in. You know, Portland's getting a lot of attention for their food right now and drink, um, which is well deserved. But the foundation for that was laid many, many decades ago, which most people are not aware of. Um, and the restaurant that I was managing um, was really a central part of that. It was one of the first restaurants, to, actually the first restaurant in Portland, to get behind that. Um, and. Interestingly, the gentleman who was the owner of the restaurant at that time started off there in 1971 as a busboy. Uh, and he saw me kind of aimlessly and not super confidently handing in my resume. And I didn't see him, but he saw me kind of shuffle through there. Um, and he decided to give me a call back. And I didn't know, you know what the position was for. I was just out of school. I was just thrilled to be getting a job. Um, and the job ended up being as an office manager, and uh, that ended up being, uh, I think, a four-month-long thing until gradually I was taking on more responsibility, and that ended up becoming the general manager of this restaurant. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how drastically that shaped my, my path, um, to be so young, to have so much responsibility, and to be able to make mistakes, to be able to fall on my face repeatedly um, in an environment that was still nurturing and supportive, um, it gave me a lot of confidence to make mistakes and take risks going forward, um, but also to obviously learn from those mistakes as well. So um, I stayed in Portland until 2008, uh, then I moved back to Atlanta, and um, that was just for family. You know, I decided it was time to go back home. Uh, in 2008, I started a nonprofit organization called the International Society of Africans and Wine. It's a mouthful, but we called it ISAW, the, the ISAW Foundation. And um, we were a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, actually the first of its kind. We had to get uh, a lot of really special attorneys who believed in our cause. Um, to lobby on our behalf and really create um, legislation with the IRS that allowed us to sell wine uh, as a tax exempt charity. I won't bore you with the 501c3 stuff, but it's probably like the biggest coup of my life to, to date. It was really, uh, it was really pretty cool. Um, but the organization was started, obviously I, I was already a sommelier at this time. Um, but again, the story of my life, uh, spontaneously, I, I read an article in Time Magazine uh, about a woman named Selena Cuff, who uh, was a Harvard MBA and started this really fascinating company where she was importing wines from black-owned vineyards or winemakers in South Africa. Um, and that's like, okay, so there's black people making wine in South Africa, what's the big deal? Well, the deal is that until the end of apartheid, there's no way that that would have ever happened. Um, and even after the apartheid, it took many years of legislation and um, changes in policy before blacks could take on a more meaningful role in the wine industry. Um, so essentially what you had is a labor force where over 90% um, 
of the, the workers were all black, uh, and yet 0% of them were owners, and maybe 1% were, less than 1% actually at that time, were in management. And uh, in 2008, there was just two black families that owned their own uh, winery or vineyard. So obviously, as an African American and from the South, I said, you know what? This is wine related. I like this. There's like a cultural element to it. There's a need for education. There's a need for shift. Um, I should be involved in this. So I reached out to Selena and um, I said, you know, I really like what you're doing. I would like to kind of be the nonprofit equivalent of what you're doing. And um, that is how I started this nonprofit, just from reading an article in time. Uh, that was. Um, a really interesting situation because shortly after we launched, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 happened. I was actually in South Africa as that was happening. Um, so we got off to a good start with fundraising and um, slowly but surely our funds started to slow down. Uh, and in 2010, uh, I had some hard choices to make about where to go with the foundation versus my own personal career. Uh, in 2010 is when I moved to San Francisco. Uh, I know this is, this feels like I'm, now that I'm talking to you guys, it's like I'm talking in a loop as I'm giving my own narrative here because there are all these cornerstone moments of, of really good fortune. Um, in 2010, I went to Nopa Restaurant, which is a fabulous restaurant uh, that I'm still a manager at. Um, and I still love it just as much, which is the biggest testament and compliment that I can pay to the restaurant, because I've spent many, many hours there. Um, but I, I went there as a diner first and had a phenomenal time. Um, and I went back and said, you know what? I just moved to California. I wasn't even living in San Francisco. Uh, I said, this is one of the best restaurants I've ever seen in my life. I just have to be a part of it. Um, so I kind of was very modestly looking for a job as a busser or server or whatever. I would have even taken a job in the kitchen. Um, but just so happens that the original GM was, had just put in his notice two weeks before uh, I was there with my resume. And I didn't know anything about San Francisco or NOPA. And I said, hey, I came here last week. I had an awesome time. Uh, I would love to work here. I'll do anything. Uh, they were like, cool, you want to manage? <laughs> I was like, not really. <laughs> I had already worked in restaurants. I knew exactly um, you know, what that would entail. I knew that I would be giving my life over to this restaurant. But um, as someone who was really invested in the business, I knew that the quality of the operation was really uh, an opportunity that I would not be able to turn down. Uh, so I accepted that position uh, because I felt the universe sort of forced my hand on that one. And uh, I'm very glad I did. So that was four years ago. And uh, in the four years that I've been in California, I've loved every second of it. And I, because of the type of work environment that has been created at NOPA, which is to say uh, an environment that supports and nurtures people's special interests and talents, um, it has allowed me to explore many, many different facets of the hospitality and restaurant sector, um, as well as tapping into a lot of different trends um, that I've observed over the last four years here. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. OK. All right. The golden age of food. This is kind of um, a new moniker that I've recently adopted uh, because I feel that it, it best describes this current period that we're in. Um, now, without the benefit of a whole lot of uh, charts and graphs, I can't really quantify the golden age of, of food. But I can tell you that the climate in 2014 is 180 degrees different than it was in 2004 when I started. Like, 
Inferno. Um, and there's a couple different things that uh, have contributed to the rise in popularity of food, um, both as, uh, as an industry, but also, I think more importantly, just speaking to this golden era, um, as a society, as a culture, you know, mainstream America, uh, we're starting to see more and more that food is a revered industry. And uh, just 10 years ago, I can tell you, based on some of the folks who were enrolled in my class, uh, there was a low barrier to entry, to say the least. Okay, so this is me in South Africa. So that was in 2008, when everything was all good, before the recession happened. Um, I'm talking to uh, some farmers there. I didn't have a beard. <laughs> uh, and 2014, how do we get to this place that we are now? How do we arrive at this golden era? Um, there's a couple different things here uh, that I think are, are pretty big factors. Um, number one, millennials. I am a millennial. Uh, I was born 30 years ago. So people who were born, I guess, four years before me and six years after me are my millennial cohorts. Uh, and we philosophically um, looked at food much differently than generations, particularly in America, have looked at food. Um, millennials are very, very well known for being uh, spontaneous, check. Uh, very well known for being having a, a penchant and an interest in technology, check. Uh, they are known for being incredibly impatient. Check. Um, so that's kind of, these are some of the, the key themes of our generation. Um, but I, I would contend that in food and in um, the restaurant industry, this, some of these qualities have actually benefited both the millennials and the industry. Um, this sort of exuberant enthusiasm, um, is always going to pay off in the kitchen, uh, as well as the access to technology. Now, part of that, it wasn't just millennials creating it, but really utilizing it, really making the world a much smaller place by communicating with chefs from all over the world um, to just see what people were doing, what people were eating. Um, we also have the Food Network, which I mentioned a little bit before. So the Food Network, launched, uh, I believe, in 1995. And um, it wasn't really until the late 2000s when the Food Network got its legs, uh -oh. um, with some early hosts like, um, who are the early guys? Bobby Flay was uh, one of the first chefs hired there. And he's still on the network. Uh, shortly after him, Mario Batali was hired, who has always been a favorite of mine and actually probably taught me as much about food as uh, anyone else. He's a brilliant cook. He's now moved on to manage his empire of restaurants and media and so forth. Um, but what the Food Network did was it, well, first of all, an Emerald Lagasse. So Emerald is really the guy that I think kind of changed the game completely um, and brought food into middle America. Um, it was also the first time that you saw this theatrical quality of food, which now dominates the Food Network um, and unfortunately has corrupted the brains of these impatient millennials who now just want to be in culinary school so they can get on television. Um, so there you go. It's, that's the dark side of the millennials. Um, we also have um, Anthony Bourdain, personal hero of mine. Uh, in 2000, Anthony Bourdain wrote a book called Kitchen Confidential. Uh, I read that book uh, in 2003, and I haven't been the same since. Uh, I can't tell you how many chefs that I've talked to over the years who have said to me, or I guess just conversations that we've had around Kitchen Confidential, because it was this really um, whimsical, kind of demented, but really, really funny 
uh, firsthand account of working in kitchens. And uh, it was the first time that people who work in kitchens who kind of have always lived by this, you know, sinister, bad boy, uh, underbelly code, had someone who was representing it in a really honest um, but funny way. And there was a number of chefs and a number of people who really felt validated in being in this industry and, and really felt like we had a spokesperson. And now, of course, 14 years later, you see Bourdain with uh, his own television show on CNN, which is like, you read that book, no one saw that coming. Um, but again, I think it speaks to this broader uh, cultural acceptance and this, this golden era of food where we're seeing uh, this shift, you know, people who were once uh, kind of subjected to the back of the house are now at the forefront of your television screens. Culinary schools, hey, that's you guys. Um, maybe not a culinary school overtly, but culinary education. Um, I'm going to talk more about this one later on because I have a lot of thoughts about culinary school uh, as someone who went to culinary school, but also. Um, would love to have, I guess, a bit more of a, a back and forth with you guys about where I think we are with culinary school. So stay tuned for that one. And then um, farmer's markets. So uh, farmer's markets, I actually do. Oops, that's not the one. I actually do have a chart for farmer's markets. And what you see here, um, so this is from the USDA. Uh, this is a year-over-year -year graph uh, from 1994 to 2014. And you can see what's happening with farmers markets in our country. Um, it's only moving in one direction. Uh, I think probably even without the benefit of this graph, many of you guys have seen in your own communities, um, you know, even when I go back uh, to my old neighborhood in Atlanta, there are farmers markets in parts of Atlanta that you would not believe. Um, and it's an amazing thing that has happened, um, even for people who aren't sort of diehard into food. Uh, this has been kind of a simmering part of what has caused, uh, at least in my opinion, this, this sort of golden era that we're in. Um, there are so many benefits to farmers markets and there's so much to be gained from farmers markets that I feel like I could almost give an hour-long talk just about farmers markets. Um, but in terms of takeaways, I think that what's really important to consider when you're at the market is that it is an intensely political act by virtue of you showing up there and buying produce from the people who grew it. If you look the person in the eye that grew your food, that is uh, an immediate uh, rejection to the corporate food system that this country has been built upon. And I know that a lot of people who are at farmer's markets are just there for the music or for the entertainment or for the really sweet tomatoes. But I'm telling you, if people who go to farmer's markets, when you put cash in the hands of the people who grew the food, you're doing a lot more than just nourishing yourself or taking care of that farmer. And what has happened is that as chefs have uh, gotten more into this idea, again, this ethos that was born in 1971 about sustainability and sourcing, as chefs have adopted this, we have started to see things like the names of farms on uh, restaurant menus. And you start to see um, and taste, more importantly, the, the virtues and the merits of local produce. Um, so I think this is a big one. I think, uh, as you can see, just between 13 and 14, oops, sorry about that, um, just a 1.5% increase. Um, so I do think we're probably leveling off a little bit just because of saturation. I mean, there are many, many neighborhoods with their own farmer's markets. Um, but again, in terms of trends, uh, I don't think this one can be overstated in terms of what has brought us to this current um, iterations. So a couple more trends, uh, what we're seeing. Uh, broader opportunity within the sector. 
Uh, so I am a great example of that. Um, because this industry has seen such tremendous growth uh, over the last decade, what has happened is that food culture has moved beyond the confines of a brick and mortar restaurant and it's kind of morphing into all sorts of different places. It's moving into the nooks and crannies of um, places that food hasn't usually shown up. I'll give you guys an example of that. For instance, um, we all know that technology in San Francisco is a really big deal. Um, the economy in San Francisco is booming as the technology industry is booming. But one of the uh, largest markets for local farms now is actually the cafeterias of tech companies. And the reason that tech companies are putting a premium on local food is because the talent, the people they want to hire, the millennials, have uh, over the last few years made a decision that, you know what, we really actually care about food. And not just in the way of nutrition, but socially and culturally, this is, and politically, this is something that we value. So they have unknowingly forced the hand of their employers who can now say, or people at Google or LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever, hey, we have this really awesome cafeteria and we source our food from these farms. Uh, and then of course when you know, some of the competition, like maybe Facebook or something says, oh wow, now LinkedIn is offering local produce from farmers, we have to do the same thing. So this is something that's really, really recent. I mean, over the last three, four years. Um, but again, you're seeing different opportunities. I mentioned media, which, you know, I have uh, mixed feelings about that, so I'll, I'll be brief, but um, just in, way, in the way of television, uh, but media has created uh, an enormous opportunity, uh, particularly with the ease of publishing. So um, you've seen a lot of food bloggers who have been thrust into different degrees of internet prominence and uh, sometimes even larger than that. Um, basically anything that you could imagine uh, outside the confines of a restaurant is sort of open season. And I think, again, one of the reasons that millennials are doing so well and, and helping to, to create these trends um, is because they have a lot of creativity, they see a spark, they have an idea, and they go for it. And because we're in such a nascent period of this new revolution, they have a lot of bandwidth to do it. They have a long runway because there's no one saying, actually, here's how you want to do that. So those low barriers to entry still apply, but the upside is so much greater now than just kind of a linear exchange of, I'm going to prepare you for how to work in a restaurant. The food world is far outside of the restaurant these days. Uh, farm to table and sourcing we talked about. Uh, eschewing culinary schools, uh-oh. Uh, I'll come back to that one in a second. The food world gets smaller. So this is a really, really big one. Does anyone know uh, what the most popular, or I guess the quote unquote best restaurant in the world is considered right now? Say again. El Bulli did close, unfortunately. This restaurant is heavily influenced. I should have had El Bulli on the slide, actually. They're a big, big deal. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, Noma in Copenhagen, Denmark. I heard someone say it. Don't be shy. You know what's up. Um, Noma restaurant. And I, what has been amazing about uh, the chef there, Rene Redzepi, and about Noma is that they have created an entire community uh, of chefs from all over the world who go eat there, go visit there, that collaborate with them. They created this uh, really, really amazing organization called MAD, um, which I don't even know what that stands for, but it's M-A-D. And uh, in terms of resources, if you guys want to sort of have a pulse on some higher level conversations or trends or top talent happening, um, just do a Google search for, for mad, mad food. Um, and I feel as much as anyone, like those guys are really on the pulse of um, what's happening in, in modern food culture. Um, okay, I wanna talk, uh, okay, and then move to media. So 
my role with media is kind of an interesting one in that when I started managing at NOPA, because I didn't know any of the farms, I decided to uh, start documenting everything around me. Um, I started to document, you know, different wines, different local farms, and those notes I kept privately, and then one day decided to share with the staff, and then that became a Tumblr blog, and then the Tumblr blog started getting more readership and traction, um, and just at the beginning of this year, uh, my role with the company shifted a little bit, and now I manage a multimedia uh, online journal called Nopalize. Um, and it's no longer just my voice, but it's kind of a first-hand account on local food culture in our um, community. So um, I am a perfect example, again, of these kind of broader opportunities within the sector, um, as well as the, the ways in which companies now uh, start to va have started to value media, and that goes for social media, um, but we're all content generators now. I mean, if you go out to a restaurant, good luck trying to see someone not taking a picture of their food and uploading it to wherever they do. And um, honestly, because of that is the reason that I've kind of landed into a dream job where now I'm actually getting paid to take pictures of those food and I'm supposed to take pictures of that food and explain it um, and share that content. So. Uh, media and the iPhone in particular is not to be um, marginalized or um, in terms of understanding the opportunities within this sector. Now culinary schools. I, uh, 10 years ago, was in culinary school and I, I should know this like off the top of my head. I probably have blocked it out of my head. I think it was like 27 grand or something. Um, and that was for just under two years, so not even quite two years. Uh, and a lot of people ask, is it worth it? Was it worth it? That's a very complicated question. Um, I mean, for me, yes. Uh, would I recommend it to other people? Honestly, no. Um, that is a, that's a potentially contentious point that I have, especially in a room full of educators. But what I will tell you guys is that um, unlike this university, a lot of culinary schools, um, especially in the late 2000s, uh, started to increase their prices dramatically and also uh, water down some of the content of the classes. And that's not just my opinion. That was shown in many, many court cases, which is why uh, a lot of those schools had to pay out large sums of money to their graduates who they promised things that they were not actually able to deliver on. Now, I do think that culinary school and school and education in general is hugely important. Um, again, for me, it was exactly the right thing to be doing. But what I think is even more important is exactly what you guys and what we're doing right now, which is why I wanted to be here, is that it's really incumbent on the educators to bring it. And the students obviously have to bring it, and there's plenty of knuckleheads that end up in schools at every single step of the way who have no business being there. But even as someone like myself, whose life it is to consume this information, it's hard for me to keep my finger on the pulse of everything that's happening. So similarly, I think that you know education has to be moving at the speed of what's happening around us. And this is not a stagnant industry. So I think a lot of the frustration, at least on behalf of my colleagues and people that I've, I've talked to this about, and this is a very, very hot topic in kitchens and among restaurants, because you have a lot of young people with a lot of debt who really wish they didn't have that debt. Um, now, my debt's almost gone because it's been so long. 
and I've stayed on my track, but there have been a lot of people who are now doing something totally different because they feel that they have to pay off this debt. So the price tag is one thing, but I think beyond the price tag is just the sense of value. Was it worth it? And repeatedly I have heard from culinary students from all over the country that I don't really know if it was worth it. And that breaks my heart a little bit, you know, again, coming as the product of a, an educator. But um, you guys have a hard job right now. You have to not just deliver conventional education in this space, but you have to do it in such a way that is, is keeping it relevant for the students. And if what is being discussed in class doesn't match the same conversations that they're hearing in restaurants, that they're seeing firsthand when they leave your class and go to work, um, that they see on television or in food publications or in blogs, then they're gonna feel a disconnect. And um, that's gonna put the students in a really difficult place. Uh, and it's gonna create a wedge and there's gonna be whispers that grow increasingly louder that say, I don't really know if it's worth it. And I think that's a bummer, you know? I don't think that we should get to that place with um, culinary education in this country. Um, but in my opinion, in terms of trends, I do think that um, it's one of the biggest challenges that we face right now. Okay, so I talked a little bit about media. And uh, this is a screenshot of Nopal Eyes. I can actually show you guys our website here. So you can see it's basically um, we pretty much every day we'll have a new uh, article. We had a popular one this week um, where we interviewed a number of chefs in San Francisco and uh, just kind of talked about, um, oops, the pictures aren't loading. Uh, we talked about this this issue facing San Francisco. Can we keep our cooks? Can our cooks afford to live in San Francisco? Um, so if you guys want to follow us there, we have a daily feed on Nopalize, uh, which of course you're welcome to check out. I would encourage you to check out. And look, these little pigs delivering a special message. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, before I conclude, um, of course, I want to just leave it open to any questions or comments. Uh, yeah, first. The question was the, about the word NOPA, N-O-P-A. So NOPA is actually just a moniker for the neighborhood in San Francisco, north of Panhandle. It's not that clever. <laughs> yes. Which street? Yeah. Uh, it's on Hayes and Divisadero. So um, if you guys know the Painted Ladies, Alamo Square Park, um, it's uh, just one block west of Alamo Square Park. And uh, yeah, again, I just want to reiterate, it can be really, it's a very busy restaurant. Um, it's a big restaurant. Uh, it can be hard to get into. So if any of you guys ever want to come to NOPA, then please do take me up on uh, the email so you don't have to bother with open table or whatever. It can be frustrating. Yes? Very good question. Very good question. Um, resources, of course. So um, I would offer MAD, as I mentioned before, uh, Rene Redzepi's project. They have an annual conference in Copenhagen um, that brings in chefs and really thought leaders in our industry. They do an amazing job with media as well. They have YouTube and on and on. Um, locally, there is a nonprofit called Quesa. They manage the Ferry Building Farmer's Market in San Francisco. It's C-U-E-S-A. Um, and they are kind of my go-to for local farms. They have re these really great profiles on who's doing what and where. Uh, I Again, I, if I may also offer our website, Nopalize. Um, we do a number of podcasts um, with thought leaders we, and chefs. We have 
uh, food videos, um, all kinds of different mediums. Um, and I'm trying to think here on the fly. Those are some pretty good ones. Oh, there, speaking of podcasts, um, if you guys are into podcasts, there is a podcast called, uh, it's Monocle Magazine. They have a weekly podcast called The Menu. Uh, it's recorded in a coffee house in London. And um, it's some of the smartest food talk that I've seen out there or heard, I guess. Um, yes? Good question. I've never been asked that question. Um, so respectfully, uh, I think that um, uh, I think it's a bit antiquated, but I think it's an, uh, an immense honor. Um, so it still has a lot of relevance. It carries a lot of weight in our community. Um, it's still a really big deal. Some restaurants more than others, um, but. I think that as people become more confident in their own aesthetic and style and preferences, um, kind of like food critics, I think you'll see the continually or the continuing um, devaluations of organizations like that, just simply because um, we another trend. We're kind of post authority. Everyone's kind of their own authority now because they have their own blog or website or whatnot. So. Yeah, if they, yeah, if they want to stay in the industry, I mean, we we can take a page from Europe. Um, their education is based on um, uh, a internship system, really. Uh, I mean, they have a they have another name for it, but it's all about mentorship and starting at the bottom and earning your stripes. You guys know this quite well, um, and I think that our country and if there is sort of a post culinary school um, movement, I don't know that there's any data to support that. That's just kind of like my gut is that we might be moving in that direction. Um, I think that the the easiest solution to that would to be put some more framework and structure around um, mentorships in schools, um, especially for you know lower income people. Uh, it's an amazing industry to be in because you don't need all of the typical accolades and degrees. Um, barrier to entry remains low, and the upside is high and getting higher um, with all of these new opportunities within the sector. So just tell them to stay with it and get in a kitchen, get in a garden, start volunteering, and go from there. And yes, go to community college. <laughs> with great educators who are engaged. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, one more. Um, well, it's kind of, well, just Every year I do a stage in Europe over the summer. Mm -hmm. This year is the first year that I'm taking eight students with me. Cool. Lucky them. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, uh, you know, I can't really speak to that one. Um, ACF might be a good pathway. I mean, just in terms of, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, drawing up funds from schools, uh, you guys are all saints for the work you do. I, this is an amazing building. So I just don't, I don't know how it works. I don't know how people get money from schools. Um, so. Yeah. Um, Europe 
provider in the country, I think, would be super powerful. Um, and having that discussion with administrators and just being able to um, add some more drama behind it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, slot. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to say um, you're a wonderful speaker. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it is so exciting for me to hear. I mean, to be in the middle of all this, it's super exciting. Thanks. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I need to have an. I need to have a conversation with the other teachers here about how we're going to put that into our classroom. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's such a it's, it's this level, and our kids are coming down here. So somehow we have to we have to bridge that gap and get those kids thinking all this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, Andrea is recording this conversation <laughs> with my consent. <laughs> so um, maybe there will be a way for you guys to listen to some of the things that you've heard. Um, and I, I really mean it about contacting me. If you guys want to reach me, I'm super easy to find. Um, I'm happy to meet someone for coffee or wine or whatever. Um, I, I just feel it's kind of an inherent responsibility for me and the work I do. As so. the K-12 educators obviously in the room, use me as a resource as the Bay Region Deputy Special Navigator because I can provide those opportunities to, to take this to the next level. We know this is only a couple of days and our intention is to really keep it alive and fresh and innovative and really continue to provide you the resources and the access that you so deserve and absolutely need. Steven has to go to Atlanta. I'm so sorry, you guys. I have to run and catch a plane.